Um, thanks. Uh, and of course, uh, it's a very uh, interesting topic to unearth, one that uh, personally I've never touched myself, but uh, we've heard from Tashli Wahid uh, a lot of issues surrounding it. One of them is, of course, inconsistency across the board when it comes to Sharia uh, audit across industries and across companies. Um, and of course, uh, we also look at talent, the priority, where there's not enough uh, auditors to go around. That number of 5.9% is actually quite uh, interesting because uh, if you have 100 auditors in the room and only five of them are ready to do both, then you are severely deprived of talent in terms of executing a Sharia audit, both in conventional as well as Sharia. Um, and of course, uh, the tail end, uh, as you was mentioning, that uh, perhaps there is an opportunity uh, for companies to start uh, exporting their services in terms of Sharia audit. But of course, you can't do all this if you don't know the uh, Talent depravity that exists in the market, uh, you don't have the experience, uh, and of course, you don't have the funnel to get all the potential auditors in and train them and have them tra and have them trained in a consistent way, uh, where we can have a very nice uh, pool of talent to work with uh, and supply them in the industry. So, because of that, there's a chicken and egg argument here on what comes first. Do we create the methodology and consistency first, or do we create the talent and hopefully these pool of talents uh, will solve the problems as they go along and work in the industry? Because of this, we have this leaders forum. We have four illustrious panelists, much of them I have worked with. Um, so let's start with uh, uh, PwC first, uh, actually. Nick, I want to focus on the idea of Sharia audit and where it stands today. And if there are leaders right now watching in, there's about 200 or 300 of us uh, right now tuning in, what would be some of the key thinking that they must have uh, in order for them to grow the industry as well as grow the Sharia audit function within their corporation in order for them to actually mainstream it across their board, across their organizations? Uh, Jay, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Inshaa Ibrahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and good morning to, to all of you. I would like uh, to thank you for inviting me to this session. Uh, also, Assalamu alaikum to uh, Datuk Nik, uh, Datuk Muhammad Reza, and also Inshaa Nazli, uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, Inshaa Ibrahim, a very good and very, very, very uh, deep uh, question for, for, for the first one. Um, but, but I think I will just uh, give a, a very short answer first and then I will, we will just um, expand on it uh, later. So to answer your question in terms of what the Sharia auditors need to have, uh, to me, uh, increasingly nowadays, it's about understanding uh, the stakeholder uh, expectations, which in my view has now gone beyond a lot more uh, than just uh, making sure things are halal, uh, making sure activities are, are Sharia compliant. Now, now why, why do I say this? Um, based on my experience, um, a lot of um, effort undertaken by Sharia auditors, I mean, not, not, not all, um, um, I mean, of course, generally is, uh, you know, we, we look at whether the transactions comply with the Sharia principles, uh, we make sure that the contracts are, are valid, we make sure that the processes are correct, the rest of it, which are, of course, very, very important. But if you look at it from the stakeholder's perspective right now, and what, what I mean by stakeholders are customers, the customers who, who, who use Islamic finance products, many of those are, 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 are getting a are young, are young population now. If you look at it from the perspective of investors and also regulators, a lot more people are expecting more uh, than just uh, complying with Sharia rules. Uh, people are also expecting that um, uh, Islamic finance also do something which is more aligned towards uh, ESG agenda, for example, making sure that financial institutions ensure that not just their products are halal, but basically support economic activities which are environmentally sustainable um, you know, with, with strong social objectives. So basically, in a crux, uh, that will then cascade down to the expectations of what Sharia auditors need to do. And in my view, uh, once we understand what the stakeholder expectations are, it's not just about making sure that things comply with the Sharia principles, but it also uh, embrace uh, the, the whole strategy of uh, making uh, Islamic finance good or toyiban rather than just halal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nick. From one Nick, we move on to another Nick. Dato Nick Ashudin, of course, uh, is the richest among us when it comes to the piggy bank size. And of course, uh, you would have to go through a lot of screening and auditing for all the investing companies that you work with. And what's worse, at least for Tabung Haji, is that um, as a depositor, 
uh, we don't necessarily know the process that uh, goes through in your organization, uh, which touch upon the biggest point that Tansri Wahid had just now, which is the inconsistent methodology across companies screening. So my question to you, Dr. Nick, is this. How do you ensure that the screening that you do across the investing companies that you enter is number one, consistent, and number two, actually ob uh, achieves that larger objective of uh, achieving Makassit Sharia, Dr. Nick? Well, uh, Pernay Ibrahim, uh, you always uh, meet my expectation when it comes to your introduction. Um, well, uh, before uh, answering your question, I think I agree with uh, Nick Sharizal that when we look at Sharia, we have to understand that it is uh, all encompassing and it's not limited to just uh, products that you sell or financing that you obtain to finance your business. It's an end to end concept and principle. And I think this is important when we discuss about this topic today to make sure that we are clear of the boundary of what we are talking about. Because um, when you talk about Sharia, and I, I can share some experience that I have in Bank Islam, for example, would you don't look at Sharia only at products, you don't look at Sharia only at financing, but you look at the way you run your business. And I think this is uh, in line with what Tansri Wahid mentioned, in line with what Sharizal mentioned, it's about applying the whole concept of Sharia and, and, and I think the most important part of that is the institution, the organization itself, consciously adopt the principle rather than it's being externally imposed. So I think uh, that to me is very important. And then of course, um, when you talk about uh, Sharia, uh, especially when you start to look into the details part of it, accounting, auditing, uh, one uh, issue is about uh, what will be the parameters that we're looking at. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, this will be the, the challenge, but I think to a certain extent, this is part and parcel of Sharia where there would be uh, differences of views, but it's within a certain uh, uh, scope that people can agree on. And, and, and I, I like your, your point about Makassib because uh, when you look at compliance, does it mean that automatically it achieves the objectives? So I think this is something which uh, uh, is very important and, and I think in our market sometimes the understanding of Sharia is quite, uh, I would say, traditional in the sense that it get, it's limited to uh, specific uh, rituals but it's not, it's not seen as a holistic manner. Just give you an example. Uh, you have a traffic light that, uh, that is a, they're supposed to you know, avoid accident. People stop when the, right is, when the light is red so that you, know, you don't have an uh, accident. But assuming that somebody you know, uh, just, just pass on without uh, you know, complying with the light, then you have accident, you can have damage to property and you can have death. And these are all uh, incorporated in Makassid of Sharia, meaning uh, you know the Makassid. One of the Makassids is talking about protecting uh, life and livelihood, as well as uh, protecting property. So the installation of the traffic light itself is a very much Sharia uh, uh, activity. So I think uh, if you look at that concept, uh, especially in running organization, I think it's is definitely beyond uh, product and financing. So I hope uh, when we talk about uh, this, uh, we are careful in terms of uh, understanding the scope that we're talking about. But coming back to your question, uh, I think uh, while there could be differences in terms of uh, certain views, but uh, if, for example, you look at uh, the nature of business, you look at uh, the financing uh, approach and you know certain basic corporate governance, I think, uh, uh, I don't see much uh, disputes in terms of that part. But once you start to go into further detail, there may be, uh, you know, there could be uh, differences of view. But uh, this is where uh, I would say that uh, the issue of competency is very important. And the broadness of knowledge and experience, uh, especially in dealing with you know, certain uh, emerging concepts, emerging ideas. So I think uh, uh, my, my closing point uh, at this moment is that while we talk about Sharia audit, and, and I believe that it is important to support the capital market, the Islamic uh, financing sector, but we need to appreciate that uh, Sharia is more, uh, is more uh, holistic and we have to understand Sharia uh, wholesomely. And I think uh, as we progress further into this uh, subject, I think uh, you can see uh, the, the, the beauty of uh, Sharia and the, the, how audit can help 
that to be uh, experienced and externalized uh, by the stakeholders. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nick. So for the participants, uh, Q&A is available. You just type in the box uh, on the right side of your screen um, and I'll be able to pick it up if it's relevant to the conversation. Um, let's move on to uh, Jake Nasli. Um, when we talk about uh, what Dr. Nick was mentioning just now, um, compliance doesn't necessarily mean achieving the objective. I mean, I can pray five times a day and I meet the compliance level, but I mean, you know, if it's just a ritualistic notion, then I don't really appreciate what the solat is all about. That's the whole point. But on, on one side, we're talking about an area where it's profitability uh, and, and urgency and timeliness. I mean, Afin Bank, after all, is a profit-making entity. So let's talk about the need for you to comply, but at the same time, to push forward the higher agenda uh, of trying to uh, improve on the integrity of the Sharia assurance, as well as achieving the objectives of Akasi Sharia. Before we can actually understand the whole concept of this conference, which is to mainstream Sharia audit into the organizations that you're working in. So for instance, if you can uh, mainstream Sharia audit inside Afin Islamic Bank, can you then export that to the Afin group, for instance? There's a lot of questions here. Let's start with the easiest one. What do you do as a leader when you want to focus on expediency versus trying to achieve a higher agenda? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. First of all, as what Datuk Nick was saying just now, it's, it's not about the product. It's not about the, the, the financial numbers. So the compliance or the Sharia audit, the audit, the Sharia compliance side for, the, for, for us, for the bank, it has to be the whole process, the whole value chain. So, uh, Afin Islamic is even in a more interesting uh, situation, uh, Cik Ibrahim, because we are we are a leverage model. You know? Afin, uh, while Afin Islamic come up with a product, come up with a process, the distribution side is done at the bank, the conventional side. Yeah. So the, the, the challenges or rather the, that we face are to make people understand why we do such a thing. There are, for example, in terms of product or services that we provide, there are charges that uh, the conventional bank can, can, can impose to the customer. But on the Islamic side, there are some limitations. The, the only different or rather the, the, the best way for me, from my personal view or my experience, to address this is to explain to people, to our our leverage model, to our distribution side, why we are doing such a thing. Understanding, look, this is the thing. For example, we have committed certain line to, to a customer, whether the customer use or not use, it is, it's, it's the line has been given. We have agreed. You cannot force them by putting up additional charges and all those things. And there are cases, for example, uh, we have to make people understand before they sell a product, you know, with respect to our product and services, you really have to explain. Of course, all uh, bank conventional or something has to explain, but for Islamic side, you have to be even more detailed and to be fair to the customer. So the the, the Makassib Sharia, the, 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 what you call it, the, I didn't look at the compliance side. I, I would want our people, especially even our distributor, to understand why we are doing this in such a way and 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 that still benefit the bank, the group as a whole. So my view is, as what Datuk Ni was saying, it's not just about the end product, what we sell and we do auditing on, on this thing, but we have to make people understand why we are doing such a thing. Only then we can move forward uh, or rather bring, bring the mainstream, the Sharia audit to the mainstream. And then if I may add uh, what Tan Sri Wahid was saying just now, there were two risks that we face with respect to not meeting the Sharia, the Sharia audit, which is legal and reputational. But in, in the bank side, if I may add, there's, another, there's also a financial risk to it. We have to make people understand when there is a Sharia non-compliant issue, you cannot recognize any income derived from that transaction. So it mm -hmm. creates a massive uh, financial risk also to the bank, especially the Islamic bank. So again, to make sure or rather to really ensure that everybody is in line the best way is to make people understand why we are doing this way. So that, that's how I, I, I address this issue. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you, Chen Azri. Um, Datuk Reza, we, we move from a profit-making entity to a non-profit. Yapim, of course, uh, is a trust. Uh, and we look at how uh, Sharia audit is extremely crucial for any type of organization. That's what the keynote speech, uh, speech was all about. Um, sole proprietorship, individuals, GFCs, MNCs, even government organizations. Uh, of all the investigations that Tyson Wagner mentioned, one of them is, of course, uh, non profit. Uh, so let's talk about how uh, Sharia audit is extremely crucial uh, for it to be executed, yes. even for a non profit like uh, uh, like Yape. Uh, thank you, Jay Brain. Thank you, Jay Brain. Thank you, Jay Brain. Hold on, I have a Okay, sorry. Um, if I could uh, start by saying uh, welcome, uh, Sheikh Brain, uh, and then uh, uh, the rest of the panel, uh, Sheikh Nick Hashuddin, uh, Datuk Nick Hashuddin, Sheikh Nazli, my old friend, uh, and Nick, who's doing some work with us as well. Um, as a non profit organization, all I can say is that uh, we are at the infancy of uh, Sharia audit. Uh, and when we look at Sharia audit, uh, it is something that we need to move forward. I mean, uh, today, uh, what is important is that uh, there is a differential between uh, 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 conventional and Islamic. And the difference, part of this difference is, is conducting Sharia audit. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, agencies are more uh, focused on uh, doing the internal and external audit side of things. And uh, therefore, uh, Sharia audit uh, at the uh, agency side is something that we are picking up. So we, we only have just passed the, uh, you know, things like halal certification uh, method, and all that and and moving on to the next level of sharia audit uh, is something that uh, is going to be a big challenge for all of us um as 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 an ex uh, banker and uh, uh, and uh, also now in a government agency i think um let me just uh, articulate a little bit about this topic as well Chen Ryan. um actually um Sharia audit is actually an afterthought. And this is our biggest problem in the industry. Uh, because uh, Sharia audit came after everything else came, after Islamic finance came. And we are actually, as an industry, and, and I'm not only referring uh, to the to us, in uh, the uh, but to even financial institutions, we are struggling. Uh, audit at at its very level is is very very organized uh audit has got external audit internal audit uh and uh and there are opinions that are being shared by the external auditor the internal auditor helps in the process but when we are dealing with sharia audit what we are seeing is that we haven't even passed that level of whether you need an external opinion or an internal opinion and there's a convolution mix up in this whole uh, scenario on uh, external and internal audit. And then you have the Sharia committee making statements uh, with regards to uh, trueness and fairness of an, of an account. And the Sharia committee makes its opinion based on internal audit. So uh, there are a lot of issues uh, pertaining to the industry. And, what we, have, we are seeing also is the role of external auditors coming in more and more uh, in terms of looking at the Sharia audit compliance. So actually, we as an industry uh, really need to sort ourselves out. I remember my days as an auditor. Uh, we're very clear. We, we go in, we have asset. Uh, Nick will tell you this. You have asset. Uh, uh, liability audit, uh, very organized audit programs, and and all that which are which are being done, and then we do the audit process, and then is a very clear opinion that comes out from it. 
In Sharia audit, we are still struggling. And this is where I feel uh, the role of people like uh, uh, the MIA is very important in terms of getting this whole process organized. Uh, and for once, look at the various uh, 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 industry and best norms. And once that is being established, then uh, agencies like us uh, will benefit uh, tremendously from the uh, Sharia audit uh, process. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Reza, when I was pursuing my bachelor's degree many, many years ago, uh, assurance and auditing came last in my final year, and I even postponed it to a point where I had to do audit one and two in the same semester. It wasn't legal, but I still graduated because that's the whole nature of auditing. Nobody puts it at the forefront, and it's always an afterthought. And then you put the layer of Sharia on audit, lagi lah, you will be pushed behind. Uh, it's no one that it's only 5.9% according to that number that I'm sure shared that is audited. Which, which is really critical because we have lofty ideals. Uh, Dr. Nick was mentioning we need to understand the scope. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, some views that says that shari uh, sorry conventional audit isn't sufficient, uh, that we need Sharia audit to do more. These are the things that is grappling uh, the practitioners in the industry and the organizations that appoint auditors, whether or not internal or external. See, I don't want to go, you know, everywhere because it's a big topic to unearth. Therefore, my, my question to the panelists, anyone, any four of you is going to be, can take this, is this. What is the first step forward? Quite honestly, do, do, we, do we tell the Sharia committee to just focus on some areas, don't look at the accounts? Do we do we ask external auditors to beef up on their Sharia audit capabilities and start advising us? And perhaps that third party assurance can give us that uh, Sharia integrity that we all look for. What would be the first step for organizations and for talents, perhaps as students turning, tuning in as well, what do we do to make this industry a little bit more vibrant and viable in order for us to achieve that lofty goals later on. Small steps, what would be the small steps, basically? Uh, any of the panelists can do this. Uh, Brian, but for, for looking from the bank or the Islamic financial institution angle, this is my view. Currently, we do have external auditors, but we are looking at the account as per accounting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, While the, the Sharia audit is uh, it's heavily dependent with the internal, as what Datuk Reza said. We have a internal Sharia audit team. We have a Sharia committee that look into this. But as per account, I stand corrected. It's being viewed as my numbers are similar to the treatment of the numbers are similar to how the bank, the conventional side, are being audited. Yeah, uh, that, that's that's not much different from the from the perspective, I suppose. The accounting standard are all the same yeah uh my thought is if you want if you want to progress further the validation from a third party currently my intern sharia, sharia audit is still internal yes they we maintain the independent but it will be the next step when we want to move forward for the acceptance is the validation from the third party yes your process are all uh in compliance Yes, the account are all in compliance. So these are probably the next step uh, on how we want to do it. Uh, to do it, I would assume we have to leave it uh, to the to the professional bodies to look at it. Uh, but we do send our people, uh, our internal Sharia audit, to attend courses provided by the the bodies to make sure that they are competent enough. But in all honesty. The, my internal Sharia audit is just looking at the processes, just looking at the contract, just looking at it. It's not so much on the financial side. Yeah, probably the view Can is I, yeah. So yeah, if, if the financial sorry, audit, is the same, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I mean the view is if the financial is the same, then we can apply the same treatment. But, but I would assume the validation from a third party is available. Uh, 
uh, Tenazli, one question is talking about what is the difference between Sharia audit and Sharia review. Uh, maybe you can maybe you can address this, uh, Tenazli. Yeah. The difference between Sharia audit and Sharia review. Well, uh, for me, the, for for Afin Islamic, Sharia review is uh, is part of the business. Is the second line of defense. Yeah, it is similar to compliance and all. This will make sure first. And the third line of defense is Sharia Sharia audit, similar with together with our internal audit. So these are the two separation that we have now. Uh, uh, Sharia review is more of a preventive uh, measure that we want to make sure that we all are compliant. But Sharia audit will come in in the, the, the last leg to make sure whatever we have done or you know, we, we do not miss anything that uh, that re the review team will, will have uh, gone through. Sharia review probably uh, recite in, in most bank, either reside internally within the Islamic bank or reside with the compliance. But the, under the new Sharia governance framework that we set up, the Sharia review team is now residing uh, together with compliance. It's totally independent from uh, Afin Islamic or the entity itself. All right, thank you, Ajit Azli. Let's move to uh, uh, Sorry, Dr. Reza, you have something to add? Uh, a few things. Uh, on your question on what is the step forward uh, to make this industry vibrant, uh, I think the only way forward is uh, regulation and uh, more and more regulation that comes in is going to drive this forward because until this point in time, when uh, if the regulators did not say anything, we wouldn't be talking even of Sharia audit because regulation has come in. That is why Sharia audit has started. So in order to go to the next step, uh, we need to have more regulations to come in because nobody is going to do Sharia audit on a voluntary basis. So therefore, regulators need to come in and say that we want an opinion on this matter pertaining to Sharia. So this, it's very important that uh, the regulators push this agenda forward. So that 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 is uh, something that that needs to to happen. Thanks. Uh, Chair let's let's talk about that a bit. Do you believe that more regulations is needed for something like this to grow, or do you believe that perhaps practitioners can do best practices for themselves, um, devoid of laws being put in place? Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, I saw uh, Dato Nick uh, raise a hand just and Dato, would you, you like to go first? I, I saw that you, you wanted to say something. Uh, we have a slightly different experience in Tabo Haji uh, for the very fact that uh, Tabo Haji was established because uh, there was no institution in 1960s that uh, invest in a Sharia uh, compliant uh, approach, and and because of that, it becomes the the main uh, the reason detail of Tabul Haji. You know, you must uh, exist because of Sharia, and and until today, uh, if you look at our act, uh, there's no uh, specific requirement in terms of that. But given the the reason why we established and and how important we are to the Islamic community, because uh, not only we. We invest the money, but the money is used to fulfill their religious obligation, uh, meaning Haji. Uh, it is very important for us to 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 be uh, in compliance uh, in in all aspect of our business. So uh, perhaps maybe because the way we were set up, uh, embedded, uh, you know, Sharia is embedded uh, from day one. So uh, because of that, uh, we do have a Sharia committee. Uh, uh, we do have uh, uh, a review, or, or, and, and I think we are even integrating the, the Sharia review or audit part into the uh, the overall uh, annual audit or in, uh, internal audit process. So um, there are situations where uh, the demand for Sharia audit can come naturally. Okay, so we have two opposing views here. Um, natural implementation versus uh, enforcement in terms of uh, regulation. Jenny, uh, go ahead. 
Oh, okay, thank you, Mr. Ibrahim. Uh, I, I like to, to, to look at it from a different di dimension. Uh, I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, number one is alignment of objective, and number two is efficiency. Number one, alignment of objective. Why, why do I think it's important? I think when it comes to Sharia audit, uh, we have to realize that uh, the approach, the objective may not be a uh, standard common across all because Tabung Haji's objective may be different from Yapi, may be different from Afin Islamic. So, so what we need, number one, is an alignment of objective for each organization between the board, the Sharia committee, and the Sharia audit. Now, people might think that uh, alignment of objectives are automatic. Everyone is on the same page. But in my experience, sometimes not necessarily. You know, uh, the Sharia committee uh, has uh, wants uh, certain things to be done. The Sharia, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Sharia auditor took a different strategy and the board had a, have a different point of view. Uh, so, so I think number one, it's very important to get everyone aligned uh, to discuss what are the strategic Sharia objective for that particular organization. Number one, I can say, I think typically everyone agree that Sharia Compliance is important. Uh, it cannot, uh, you know, it have to be followed uh, because if Sharia compliance are broken, then you have reputational risk, financial risk, and the rest of it. That one is is easy. But number two, um, you know, I would encourage the, the stakeholders to think. Let's say if you take an Islamic financial institution, what would be the reputational impact if that particular Islamic bank is seen as supporting? Um, a, a customer which conducts, which engages in unfair labor practices. What, how would the public see when that particular Islamic bank extend financing to an activity which are envi environmentally unsustainable? Uh, is, are these issues important or not? Because if these issues are important, then I would argue that uh, the Sharia audit should also look into, into those things, you know, because these are uh, the, the alignment of strategic objectives. That's number one. Uh, number two is about efficiency. Now, in my experience, um, when I, um, uh, I uh, a lot of the things which Sharia auditors do are generally still quite manual. I think there's been an encouraging trend towards more automation, more efficiency. But but I give you an example. Uh, for example, uh, within the Sharia audit, a lot of Sharia auditors look at the contracts and they look at the statements, the words, and, and everything. And that takes a lot of hours, a lot of days. Nowadays, we have artificial intelligence which can scan a document and highlight anomalies, you know, so, so that's one potential. Uh, another example where Sharia auditors spend a lot of time, uh, they would actually uh, look at whether certain parameters are broken. So, for example, if the customers have uh, a lot of proportion of non-Sharia compliant income, they would actually look at the report, they would interview, and perhaps a few weeks later come up with a finding. But when you think about it, a lot of these things can be designed around a technology. You can have a dashboard where if certain parameters, certain Sharia rules are broken, immediately that dashboard highlights what the problems are and Sharia auditors can zoom in into that area within seconds, you know, uh, if not, if not um, you know, uh, minutes. Uh, so, so in my view, uh, those are the two things that I, I think uh, the, the, the profession should focus on. Number one is the alignment of the objective, making sure everyone's on the same page. And number two, finding ways uh, towards getting more efficiency from that process and probably by the use of technology. Thank you. Uh, that this is a very um, critical moment to actually touch upon some bigger ideas that uh, perhaps you can handle. Uh, and it ties in with a question that comes in from Hazami Zainal from Brunei, Bank Islam Brunei. Um, he was talking about should Sharia audit perform the audit on financial statements, even if it's been done by external auditors. This this type of question, it's an operational question, but it touches upon the bigger topic of what are the expectations of Sharia auditors? Are they here to do just assurance or are they supposed to do uh, advisory as well? Are they supposed to spot the problems using your dashboard that you know highlights up a particular non-compliance, or are they supposed to come in and say, you know what, this is good, but in order for you to do more, you have to do this? What is the scope of the modern Sharia auditors, and how should we view it uh, in a way where we can create talents to meet that kind of expectations, uh, Jenny? Um, okay, so uh, on the topic of uh, financial statements, uh, th th this is my personal point, point, point of view. Um, so, so to me, um, the, the objective of the, it goes back to the objective of what is uh, you're trying to do 
from reviewing that financial statement. So in my view, if the objective is to make sure that the, fin the numbers in the financial statements comply with the international financial reporting standards, uh, in my view, that role is better played by the management, by the finance department, by the external auditors, and so on. But if the objective is, um, you know, are, are there any particular information within these financial statements which might indicate that certain areas within our business are not Shara compliant or we're not focusing on the Shara objective? I, I think Shara audit can, can play, play a role to, to, towards that. Um, so, so, so that's point number one. Number two, you mentioned about, uh, you know, what, 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 what can be done towards it. I think it goes back to my earlier assertion. It's about understanding what exactly is the strategic objective that, trying to, that we're trying to achieve and, and what are the, 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 the mission for each of the different parts of the people within that organization. Because in my view, uh, the external auditors have a specific mission, the shadow auditors have a specific mission, and the risk management people have a specific objective, each playing its own role towards uh, making sure that the organization um, you know, achieves its objective. Thank you. Um, th thank you. Uh, Dato Ni Hashuddin, do you have um, anything to add on this? Well, um, I think that's why I think it's, it's important, I think especially for MIA, to really define uh, what are they advocating. I think uh, the context of this conference is about uh, ensuring uh, Sharia compliance in the uh, Islamic finance industry. All right? And I think uh, maybe the focus at the moment is more on the products, on, on certain processes. But as, as I mentioned earlier, and I think as what was discussed, Sharia is a wider than that. And the risk of not um, uh, labeling this Sharia audit properly uh, will have uh, will add confusion. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the question just now about whether Sharia auditors should look into financial statement, I think this goes even to whether IFRS is Sharia or not. You know, and this had been debated, you know, because you have IOF in the Middle East. And, and to me, the root cause of this is our own understanding of Sharia. We tend to limit Sharia, and Sharia is only when you have the word I or something in front of anything. In the absence of that, it's considered conventional and non Sharia. So I think uh, the point that I'm raising this, because I don't have that many opportunities to address this kind of crowd, is be careful in terms of what we are trying to do. I really appreciate uh, about the effort in strengthening auditing uh, in, in, in the Islamic uh, finance industry because it's very important. But as we talk about expanding uh, the role and concept of Sharia auditing, uh, it, we have to be very careful so that we ourselves are not confused and the stakeholders are not confused themselves. I think the theme that we're getting out of this uh, last uh, 10 or 20 minutes is about scope definition, um, objective setting, and of course, uh, direction, uh, directional management. Uh, and, and these are meant to be defined by the leaders of organizations, both within F, um, uh, Islamic financial institutions, uh, whether or not they're standalone, like, uh, for instance, like uh, Tabu Haji, or whether or not they're in a group, mixed group, like uh, Afin, for instance, or whether or not they are in NGOs, and of course, whether or not they're external, like PwC, for instance. Uh, but the scope setting uh, sometimes is back to that whole uh, uh, comment of um, uh, ritualistic. You have a template. If you want to you know, go for a financial statement, this is the definition setting. Uh, if you're an audit internally, this is the, it's just that. I mean, you just go to folder number three, item number five, that's the that's template. We can't, based on 10, 20 minutes that we've had, we, we can't do that anymore because number one, definition setting changes uh, over time. And number two, circumstances dictate necessity. Uh, Chen Azli was mentioning just now, if there is a line somewhere in the financial statement that talks about pure income, then yes, then we should really get um, the auditor's uh, eyes to actually look at the financial statement as per what J, uh, the Sharizal was mentioning. But if it's not, then leave it, right? Uh, but this does not sit well with uh, people that go for compliance. I'm not talking about Sharia compliance, but compliance per se. Because compliance, by nature, they have a check checkbox. They have 10 checkbox, they tick one after another, failure of which you're not compliant. But this, the world doesn't work in black and white for Sharia. 
And, and back to that point of how do we make this industry vibrant? Because when you talk about conventional audit, it's easy. There's a checkbox, get it done, train people to get it done, get companies to comply, khalas. But this can't be done for Sharia auditing. Are we making things a little bit more complicated for ourselves in order for this industry to flourish? What, what, what is the limitations that we are imposing on ourselves here? Uh, anyone can take this. Uh, uh, hopefully somebody takes this because kalau tak malu eh. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Reza, I yeah, so. I think I just wanted to address your, the, the scope of the modern Sharia auditors as well uh, and, and encompass all this. Uh, basically, what Datuk Nick said is very important. Sharia is all encompassing. It's, it's actually everything, you know, and, and we, we actually get, get, get very confused because we have Sharia audit, which is done by Sharia auditors. We have Sharia review, which is done by compliance department, and we have Sharia risk, which is done by risk department. So, in encompassing all that, you you have to audit all this in order to look at that. So, and 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 I give you an example like what uh, Chit Nazli mentioned about calculating income. You have to audit income because uh, certain levels of income may not be Sharia compliant. Asset use. You have to know what your asset is being used so that it's not being used in a non-Sharia compliant manner. And then we, we, we haven't even got into the people behavior. People behavior also comes in because if people don't behave properly, we have a reputational risk and, 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 and the other risk that comes uh, forward to this. So actually, uh, you know, this whole uh, concept of uh, the Sharia audit uh, as the day goes by, will get bigger and bigger. And I can tell you for once, uh, uh, in my previous shop, they tell me that even the external auditors look at uh, Sharia issues because their opinion is being affected uh, by uh, whatever happens uh, Sharia-wise in an organization because uh, one wrong transaction or one uh, something that doesn't happen will, will impact the whole organization in terms of its uh, future viability. So the or, or external auditors have got to look at it. So as we move forward, uh, all I can tell you is that the external auditor will also be a Sharia auditor and, and, and they will acquire these skills as time goes by. And, and uh, this is something that the industry must face and this is where the role of the MIA and all that has got to come in to actually define and start looking at all these issues because uh, a, a, a Sharia institution uh, builds its pillar around Sharia. Thanks. Okay, it looks like we are slowly applying pressure on MIA uh, to do more. Uh, I don't know whether this uh, was the idea of MIA to get more jobs from us. Uh, but uh, Chenny, I saw you smiling just now when you were mentioning that uh, professional uh, auditors should do Sharia auditing. Do uh, you have uh, uh, some thoughts you want to share? Well, well I, I think my view is um, as an external auditor, we always apply the principle that whenever we audit an organization, that specialist industry skills have to apply, uh, not just in Islamic finance. So, for example, uh, within our, our firm, uh, we have people who specialize um, you know, in plantations, people who specialize in communications and the rest of it. Because as auditors, if you don't know the industry, uh, you can follow the checklist, but you will not be able to do a very a holistic audit, uh, which I would like to then touch on your point, Encik Ibrahim, about the use of uh, template, the use of checklist and, and the rest of it. Is, it. is it too much of it? And I find, uh, you know, as an auditor, that, that is a very fascinating question. Uh, now, the thing is, um, are templates and checklists good or bad? I think it depends on the context. For example, if the context is an auditor needs to check something very specific, there are 10 rules, 10 parameters that have to be checked. A template and a checklist is very useful because it ensures consistency across the checking. But the problem is too much reliance and too much focus on checklists can also be dangerous. Why do I say dangerous? Okay, let's look at the, the, the Islamic finance context. Um, one of the most damaging things that can happen to the Islamic finance uh, industry uh, is when a customer comes to the branch 
um, speaks to the to the to the to the, to the counter officer and, and start asking question what is the difference between this product that product and so on and the response that the customer get is number one oh it's actually not just that different it just got I in front of it uh, these are just to to you know you you get um, you know no different don't worry about it start giving the wrong information the wrong um, um, you know misrepresentation and the rest of it. So let's imagine that particular context, and this happens a lot uh, within within the industry. Um, you may have um, all the checklists been ticked. Um, the 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 people attend training. The contract is fine. The process is fine. Got commodity and the rest of it. But the communication is wrong. Now, if an auditor only rely on that specific check of checklists, then uh, no issues will be identified. But we have this situation where customers feel cynical about Islamic finance feel confused because it's not explained properly. And, and to be honest, um, it basically affects the whole integrity and reputation of Islamic finance. So this is, in my view, where sometimes uh, the use of checklists um, and also um, you know, have to be looked in within context. Uh, but the objective of an auditor doesn't mean whether external auditor, internal auditor, or, or shara auditor is to make sure that uh, a, a holistic point of view is given out, not just limited by checklists. Thank you. See, this is the, the, the issue that leaders are facing because this is a leaders forum. Uh, when it comes to share audit, everything depends on circumstances and objectivity. But when you go down to the operational aspect, um, there's a lot of questions on the sidebar that talks about the operational aspect. Number one, uh, inconsistency. Chin, uh, Chin Fong was ask, is asking um, because of the different methodologies that is being put in place, there is an inconsistency in Sharia audit. How would auditors on the ground uh, refer to? Uh, what would be some of the consistent methodology that can, that they can refer to? You see, th these are these are real tangible questions. And remember, when 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 we do audit, it's not just you know I have the whole month to audit one particular item. You know, you don't have that luxury. You have to do a lot of things. Uh, but, so th another operational question that was asked that was being asked uh, is of course from Haji. Use Rudin uh, Haji Yahya from type uh, Brunei. Um, he's asking overlapping roles, right? Uh, what Dr. Reza was mentioning just now. So his particular question was, okay, I am doing uh, Sharia audit, um, but you know there's an issue between Sharia audit and Sharia review uh, because at times both uh, working scopes are overlapping each other. How do I distinguish what I am doing and what I'm not supposed to do between the two? Um, and making sure that I do not cross over between one or the other. Again, we're, we're, we're down to solving operational issues for the individual down there that might not have the kind of visibility that partners in, in audit firms have or, or CEOs in a company have. How do we make this tangible for our folks in the organization to be able to carry out their job in earnest? I think that is the main crux of this debate, uh, whether or not we can operationalize the function of Sharia audit in our organizations. Uh, anyone who wants to take this? Uh, if I, may, I think the overlapping between Sharia review and Sharia audit also exists on the conventional, in the conventional space with respect to compliance and internal auditor. So there will be some areas of overlap and, and all those things. But I like what Jenny Sariza was saying earlier. It's the context setting or the, the, the you know, alignment of the, the, what you call it, the direction of the organization. So it's still then it will become an organi internal organization. Like for one organization, for example, one Islamic financial institution may put a statement, look, I only do sustainable financing i only i will not do the one that go uh, against uh, uh, for, for whatever reason so when the two audit come even though one is uh, our internal charity audit and when this statement has been said i will i would expect when i sit down with my charity audit team look i will tell them look go and see is there any area that i may have breached I think. And similarly, when I will be sit down with external auditor, I will say, please also scan to see whether Apin Islamic as an organization has diverted or diverged a bit from its 
the statement of intent. Yeah. So, so, but again, then uh, we will not be we will not be able to do an industry wide because different entities may have different direction or different statement of intent. So again, it become an individualistic to each entity. But at least we have to start somewhere. We have to start bringing in my my personal view, the external auditor to come in and and look beyond financial statement. It, it is uh, I think that to me was that to me was saying it, this is a if I may, as an individual, it's the whole journey. It's a lifestyle. It's the lifestyle within an Islamic financial institution that you comply. Yeah. So, so it's not just the end result where whatever product, whatever financial statement, income that we have. Uh, this is something young. The one I would say a bit more broad and a bit more diverse. Hence, uh, Datuk Reza rightly put it. Uh, the question: Do we need a regulatory? enforcement or do we allow uh, us to move along as, as a natural progress progression towards towards this area yeah thank you all right um anybody wants to add on chinasli's comment all right okay uh we have a poll right now um for those participants that are tuning in right now um the question is do you believe your company has the desire to quote unquote export Sharia audit functions to non Sharia units? Um, there's three options. Uh, yes, you believe so, uh, that the ability for your company to, or the desire for your company to export Sharia unit function. No, or you're unsure. Um, right now, there's 14 people that went for the poll. Uh, perhaps uh, we can get a little bit more color uh, for you guys to go uh, and try and try out that poll over there. Uh, let's move on to some um, questions that uh, the uh, participants are asking. Uh, Nora Fendi is asking, uh, because of the current new normal COVID-19 situation, how would Sharia audit uh, move forward or adapt to these kind of uh, circumstances uh, in chain, in terms of methodologies and approach? Um, so we're bringing a little bit more of a current affair here uh, to this topic. Um, the panelists, um, anyone wants to take up this uh, question by Nora Fendi? Okay. Uh, okay, I see okay. Dato. Yeah, uh, okay. Huh? Atapa. Go ahead, Jenny. Uh, okay. Um, so, so because I, I suppose the question is um, uh, Shara audit. Uh, to, to me, there are two things. Uh, number one, Shara auditors, just like any auditors, rely on information to do its work. So, so I think number one is is to focus on how do you get that information in the situation that we have right now. So obviously, people are thinking about um, you know um, um, online auditing. People are talking about getting the information through digital means and the rest of it. Um, but but also, I would like to add um, point number two, which is more which is quite interesting. I think to me, um, in the environment that, that we have right now, the issue is not just whether how can we get the information to do the audit. What is the impact to, to our customers? Are there any particular area which we can help to, to, to ease the, the burden of our customers and therefore achieving the objective of Makasi Sharia? These are the questions which um, you know, I would encourage the stakeholders, including the Sharia auditors, to think about. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, anyone else wants to add? Right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, this one is asked uh, by, uh, let me just pull this up. Banyak banyak kepini drop down there. Okay, um, uh, Lynette Lee of FPM is asking, uh, would a holistic audit complement the review for compliance? I, I think I think what Lynette is asking is, um, do we view uh, Sharia audit as the one that is superseding all the others and perhaps uh, focus on that as the final say of assurance uh, for that uh, organization. Should that be uh, the way forward? Uh, if, if I may, uh, this is my personal view. We may differ from the rest, but what in our practice, what we have now, uh, our Sharia audit will clear ensure that all the processes, all the contract, all the income measure calculation are all in place. Then 
the external the external auditor will come in and verify. I, I suppose when external to be for the time being external auditor when they come they, when they look at financial numbers they will ask is there any Sharia non compliant issue hence is there any income that the bank cannot recognize and all those things. I would say Sharia audit is still is still part of internal audit for the time being and when the, our external auditor come it will still based on the or whatever finding from the Sharia audit and also our internal audit methods. But that is what is happening now. And in all honesty, I, I don't foresee because Sharia audit, you need to be for the time being, say what you like about independence, but you have to be part of the organization to come in and understand because we're talking about processes. It's not just about the, the end number, the financial numbers. Yeah. So you have to verify first before our esteem uh, external auditors with PwC and all those things will come in and then confirm everything. Yes, based on our check, there's no breach. All the income uh, to be calculated uh, as per compliance. Only then it will come in. Yeah. All right, uh, Dr. Reza. I agree with uh, Nazli's opinion. I think the role of the external auditor is still prevalent now. But I think as time goes by, uh, the role of uh, Sharia audit will start moving in more and more. But uh, ultimately, the public will look at the external audit report. We're not used to seeing a Sharia report yet. So that needs to be familiar on that. You, you see, I come from a government organization today. I can say that even the the government Jabatan Accountant Negara today, I don't think they have a Sharia audit uh, uh, fun, uh, um, uh, expertise on that. So, you know, we are totally, uh, or, or, or we are quite behind in terms of uh, the auditing process uh, at, at the government level on Sharia auditing. So that's something, again, that uh, the MIA can look at or, or somebody's got to look at because uh, we need to bring up the standards uh, of uh, Sharia auditing, uh, not only in uh, Islamic financial institutions, uh, but at uh, other places as well. And, and, and if we are going to make this a, a very important proponent of the uh, financial sector in Malaysia, uh, Sharia audit at the government level also has got to happen. I think uh, Dr. Verinda is really regretting having this uh, uh, forum because we seem to be piling a lot of jobs for them. Uh, within the next half an hour or so, uh, I want to focus a little bit more on um, that last bit that Tansri Wahid's speech was talking about, which is extremely relevant, which is on talent building. Um, you know, there was a time when fraternities were created to fulfill a certain function, and that brought about letters that come after your name and because of that that you know there is an industry standard people understand that if you have those letters you meet that specific criteria and that is the kind of fraternity that exists until today to a point where if you don't have the letters after your name uh, you're not going to be taken seriously uh, not because this is nothing personal but because you did not meet that status or that that that, that uh, level of assurance that you can give me as an individual to undertake your function, okay? Should um, you know organizations like MIA or international organizations like uh, CIMA, ACCA, ICAEW, you name it, right? Uh, CPA, uh, should they focus a little bit more on integrating Sharia audit learnings and functions into their main syllabus because of the demand that is that exists uh, in the market right now? Or is there a time and place for us to now create Islamic letters that comes after your name to give that certification that you can do Sharia audit um, at a particular level? Uh, you know, I mean, as much as we want to give assurance to companies, how do we give assurance that we are good enough to do the work? I think that is the key uh, question moving forward. Again, I, I don't like to go out on lofty stuff. I want to focus on operational ideas and tasks that people can go out there and execute. And the easiest thing to execute right now is to give assurance for talents and give them that certification that they can undertake that job. Um, uh, I throw this question to the panel. 
Um, anybody interested to take this up? Um, basically, uh, way back when uh, Sharia auditing was introduced, uh, uh, we were struggling in my previous shop on, on how to implement it. So what we did was um, we teamed up with uh, USIM, University Science Islam Malaysia, and ran uh, a, a, something like six months course on Sharia auditing. Uh, we drew up the skills and all that. And at the end of the day, they, you know, the, 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 uh, they even did exams and, and had certificates uh, issued to them. Uh, it was we were at the forefront of everybody else uh, when we did that and guess what happened 14 uh, people were trained 12 have left within one year of the training so uh and and that's when you are ahead of the game that's what happens and uh this was exactly what happened but in honest essence today a graduate that comes out on islamic finance today is too much of a generalist uh, today, it would help a lot if uh, an Islamic finance uh, graduate had Sharia auditing uh, as one of its key uh, uh, components uh, in their syllabus. And if that happens, I think we are going to see more and more and better training uh, that comes on that. Because uh, organizations, even like IFIM, they've done well. Uh, to, to, to have all these training programs. But uh, not many institutions are embracing uh, some of these, like uh, uh, accredited, accredited qualification in Islamic finance. Uh, that is important for, for, for people to do it. And then uh, it, they will not uh, be in non-compliance to Sharia uh, matters. But um, a whole load of training uh, in terms of uh, this needs to be done. Uh, first at the uh, higher institution level, but already we are having people in the industry which are which have to do this job. And uh, again, some someone has to come out and say that we need to have this training level in, in order for you to be a, a Sharia auditor because uh, we have a confused bunch of people uh, today doing Sharia audit because uh, they, they, they cannot differentiate between uh, you know, some of the issues uh, that was mentioned before in terms of overlapping. They don't know whether this is within their scope or, or with, without their scope. So uh, somebody's got to come out and, and, and define and spend time to look and, and make sure that this uh, training needs are, are met by the industry. Thanks. Before, before somebody, somebody, somebody uh, follow up on that uh, task, I still want to stay with Dr. Riza. When you say that somebody needs to define, um, I, I want to challenge you a bit. Who, who shall define it? Is it the CEO? Is it the group uh, chief uh, risk officer? Is it the uh, chief audit officer? Is it the CFO? Is it, uh, I, I mean, already we're talking about overlapping jobs between the functional individuals. I'm sure the C-suite also has some overlapping tasks to define who does what. Uh, what do you think of this? Uh, no, this is not the job of the CEO or, or, or the people internal. This is the job of somebody in the industry, uh, the regulators or the um, or, or, or even somebody like MIA who who has to look at all these issues. That uh, is, it, you know, uh, they're not equipped. The the, the C CIOs, the CTOs, or or, 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 or chief compliance officers, they're not equipped to look at this. They don't even know what is overlapping or not. For the moment, my advice to those who are doing on overlapping work is continue doing the overlap so that at least it is covered. If it's not covered, then we have a Sharia issue. So having overlapping uh, work at the moment is fine, uh, but, but over time, it, it should be addressed and, and it has to be addressed at the industry level. Graham, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, what is happening now is this. Uh, you have two big, big concepts combined. Audit on its own is a big concept. You can have all sort of audit. You know, you can have work, workforce audit, even your image audit and everything. And then you bring Sharia into that. So, and Sharia, is, as what we have agreed, is also, uh, you know, a very uh, wide area. So when you combine the two, you end up with, you know, 
a very big concept combined. So I think the way forward is like what uh, it film is doing is to say, okay, we have, you know, uh, a group of people who can audit uh, uh, financial, uh, financial institution, especially on products and, you know, so then we start to build one by one, block by block, then eventually you can have a more uh, encompassing profession. So I suppose uh, based on our discussion, there is a demand for that. You know, I think institutions uh, want to ensure that they comply with Sharia, especially at Tabung Haji, the uh, Islamic financial institution, or even a, a normal uh, enterprise. There's no stop, nothing stopping them to say that I want to be Sharia compliant. So then they will be looking for people who can help them to do that. Uh, first, in terms of you know standard setting, in terms of uh, defining the parameters. And then another group of people coming, uh, ensuring that you comply, and not only in terms of the process and, and control, but you achieve the objective of what you want to do. So I think uh, there, there are ample opportunities for IFIM, there are ample opportunity for, for even MIA, or even the firm themselves, the, the audit firm themselves, to, to, to come up with solution. So I think I would like to see this as a, a, a there is a market demand for it. Uh, but uh, we need to be careful in defining the scope because otherwise it becomes so big and nobody understands what we are trying to do. So uh, I like the approach now where we focus on the financial institution, we look at capability perhaps to look at the product, maybe then you look at the broader area of the institution itself, and then what will be the skill set that you need to, to, to do that. And I think it's quite obvious, I think based on uh, Datuk Reza's point, uh, it can be a complex situation and uh, being a former regulator, I mean, I can really appreciate the value of a skill set uh, to the value of work. So you need to really look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, nurturing somebody to have to, to, to who are able to understand concepts, who are able to understand how the concepts are implemented and able to trace to the outcome. And, and I think it's not an easy thing. But uh, I really applaud uh, the the effort in nurturing uh, Sharia auditors. Yeah, uh, if if I may add, uh, uh, add the go ahead. Of, yeah, yeah, at the risk of oversimplifying things, but uh, I have to apologize. I mean, the other the other professional uh, bodies that we have, for example, legal profession, you know, they have uh, either people coming up straight away as what we call it. Sharia uh, on the legal side, or people that even went studied overseas and everything, and there are certification. So for 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 Islamic financial institution, um, we want at least a, one senior partner to be uh, qualified as as a, a Sharia side, so that we maybe to force through the agenda or rather moving forward. This is something probably. The, uh, audit, the auditors may want to consider, you know, you must either, yes, you can have an auditing qualification, but there is, as what Datuk Reza said, somebody, again, it's easier said, somebody has to come up with a syllabus or content for of certification to enable this group of people that have a dual capabilities, you know, or they can even focus, move. They can come from the mainstream, mainstream auditing, but subsequently, with a proper certification and all, they can move and become specialized in this this area. Yeah. Thank you, Chen. Cheng, uh, thank you, Chen Azli. Uh, we we have to manage time. Um, some of us have uh, you know operational items to address. Some of us are more you know cerebral. We want to talk about this even longer. Um, uh, let's focus on Cik Nik Sharizal. Uh, I understand uh, that uh, we have to let you go very soon. Um, so maybe we can have some uh, parting words, uh, particularly on some thoughts uh, that you want to share when it comes to recapitulating the uh, topic that we have for this morning. Okay, well, firstly, uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to, to thank this opportunity because I've also gathered quite a lot of point of view uh, from, from this session. And, and I think uh, from, from all the point of view that I've heard today, I think there's definitely a lot more that needs to be done uh, in, the, in the Sharia audit profession and also Islamic finance uh, generally. But, but I think overall, uh, even though there could be a different uh, opinions and different methodology and different objective, but I think the principles are still the same. Um, I think the principle is um, everyone uh, listening to this and everyone in the in the in the in this session want the objective of Islamic finance to be met, and and uh, with that uh, there are a lot of uh, different components 
uh, working together to make sure that their objective is being met. Uh, specifically from the perspective Shara Audit, I think number one, the alignment of objectives, the articulation of it is, is very, very important. Uh, number two, I think um, you know, the, the, there must always be this ongoing uh, continuous effort to to to, uh, to to ensure efficiency and you can get that efficiency either through uh, technology through uh, better training better qualification and the rest of it and, and number three i think that the bigger topic of makasit sharia uh, have to be focused more within the profession if we want to play a bigger role in the industry. I think the, the, the panelists also mentioned that, uh, you know, the, 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 you know um, sometimes people tend to look at external auditors, but there is no reason why Shara auditors uh, cannot take a more prominent role. But in order for Shara audit to take a more prominent role, it have to start to look at uh, more, um, you know, issues, not just Shara compliance, but, but bigger than that. Um, I, I think that's my parting uh, comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chenik. Uh, all right, so Chenik will uh, move on to do some more auditing. And um, you know, <laughs> conversations tend to be more livelier when external auditors are, are away from us. Uh, but uh, we have some questions here uh, by the, uh, uh, by the uh, participants. Uh, one of them is, of course, uh, Faris. Um, he's asking a very uh, tangible question and think about. Ch Chenik, thank you very much, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Faris is talking about this. Uh, we, are, we have been talking about agenda setting um, and setting up the ultimate objectives of Sharia Audit. Uh, we're talking about consistency to perform Sharia Audit and uh, the issues related to it. Um, Faris is asking, let's say everything is already in place. The definition setting, the uh, purpose, the objective is all there. What are the methodology that should be used to measure the overall effectiveness and its impact? I, I don't know whether um, the three of you can, uh, or should be the people to be talking about this, um, but you can address this question head on. Uh, but if you feel that there is an organization out there that needs to understand what needs to be done in terms of uh, defining the methodology, uh, please feel free to tell Dr. Vrindajit and MIA what they need to do. Uh, Ibrahim, uh, maybe just uh, to share a bit of what I did in the past. Uh, even in the conventional audit, or I mean, the, the financial statement audit, I think different uh, organizations or different firms, we have their own methodology of uh, even when they are referring to the same standard. So I think uh, I do not see methodology as an issue because it is uh, an approach towards achieving uh, the outcome that you want from your work. So, you know, you can even, even in the audit world, you know, you can have a PwC methodology, EY methodology, KPMG methodology, but they are referring to the same standard and uh, those methodologies will help them to achieve the expectation of the standard. So I think uh, in, in the context of Sharia audit, uh, you know, people may differ in methodology, but I think they need to be able to ensure that uh, by complying with a particular methodology that uh, intended uh, intention of giving that independent view or independent opinion on what is being audited uh, will be achieved. Thank you, Dato. i uh, move on to uh, Dato Reza, please. I think in addressing and adding to what uh, Dato Nick is saying, uh, if, if we extend a little bit the methodology used in external audit, and that is the methodology mainly used is the materiality uh, issue. Can we apply this in Sharia audit? Uh, I think my answer is yes. Uh, we always should use materiality uh, in terms of looking at any uh, Sharia related issues. So is the issue material or not? And to what extent does it impact the IFI in terms of doing things? So. Uh, the methods uh, may be similar, uh, but the approach uh, towards the Sharia audit may be different. So, so uh, materiality will play a part in this, except where in circumstances where there are reputational risks and all that, then then it is totally material uh, on 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 these issues. So, applying the methodology of uh, materiality is is I think relevant in Sharia audit. Um. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rizal. Okay, Nasli, do you have something to add? If I may, uh, Datuk Ni was saying Sharia 
audit is big then or oh, and Dato Reza was saying materiality so th these are the two currently my understanding there are two diverse thought for some people may say look a non-compliant is a non-compliant regardless of whatever uh, a non-compliant even a smaller non-compliant then points back to what Dato Reza was saying is there a serious reputational issue on this it triggers it may triggers doubt in, 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 the, in the from the customer from the stakeholders uh, perspective so these are the thing that for me it probably has not been resolved in all for all intense purpose uh, when you look at applying a broader concept of auditing uh, maturity definitely is a, is a key factor so now if you want to also push for this uh, Sharia audit to be to be going into the mainstream we have to be clear on on this thing you know uh, you wouldn't want uh, I would it's not you know so there's still two views on thing a non-compliant is a non-compliant you still five ringgit or you still certain amount is considered still stealing so how do we there must be as a, uh, what you call it a forum to discuss on this thing and to firm up on this thing because otherwise uh, so even some of the question that we, we can notice there are two diverse thought with respect to this in this area so if you start pushing this to mainstream while well, this has not been resolved and then the, we may face the the companies, the institution may face some problem. Yeah, that's my thought. No, no, actually you're right, uh, Um On the point of the questions being everywhere, <laughs> let's face it, right? Um, and, and of course, this reflects the topic of the discussion, the participants coming into this forum they have a very different idea from one to the other in terms of what Sharia audit is and should be and how to improve. Um, you know, anywhere from operational questions to uh, regulatory questions to uh, industry setting questions. Um, and, and I don't know how to uh, cluster the questions together. That's why I've been asking it, you know, individually because normally when we have a topic, whatever, you know, CPO, for instance, uh, how do we do this, or windfall tax. It's a specific area because everyone understands that whole objective. And, and that's the point right now about having this leaders forum, which is to acknowledge, number one, that this topic is too broad, that people have many ideas about it. Number two, um, some people make a simplistic view of it. Uh, Dr. Niashuddin has been mentioning again and again, uh, you know, the fear is on product, the fear is on the process instead of what the objective is trying to do. Uh, and of course, number three, the talent management to address this industry, which we all can acknowledge uh, has a lot of room to grow. Um, which brings me to that point of our poll question just now. Uh, if, if the organizer can flash the result of that particular poll, uh, that we have asked participants to take. Uh, can can we see it somewhere? Is it going to be overtaken by this? Oh, Tudia. Okay. Uh, do you believe that the company has the desire to export? Yes. Um, let's put it this way: half of the people said yes, right? And and this is not surprising. Um, a lot of companies want to up their uh, their capabilities in terms of providing assurance, uh, but at the same time, they might not know or marketing. I think about uh we can't get this done even if the desire is there and there is a desire might not be an overwhelming desire half only uh, wants to do it um but we can't make it work until we tidy up the things uh internally uh, what jay nasli was mentioning just now so the next five to ten minutes uh when we part can we have uh, some closing statements by the panelists uh, just to just to bring it back down to the ground uh, and I, I don't want to stay you know oh let's 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 talk about the cerebral stuff and, and, and we can't operationalize it so so let's let's conclude in clear and concrete ways that at least the participants can go out there and try to look at Sharia audit in a very interesting light to a point where they can perhaps even mainstream it to the uh, organizations that they are in. Uh, maybe we can start uh, with Dato' Nick. Okay, uh, I, I just got three points. Uh, number one, uh, 
syariah needs to be uh, respected and adopted wholesomely. So I think uh, I, I mentioned that uh, quite a lot this morning. Uh, number two, we need to go beyond box ticking. And uh, I, I would certainly like to see uh, the audit uh, can connect uh, to the achievement of the uh, the objectives of Sharia or Makasib Sharia. And thirdly, uh, independent audit uh, is certainly important, but uh, it must be fit for purpose. So it's not just a, a, you know a, a labeling uh, that is made for convenience, but it must uh, add value uh, to to the whole. Uh, uh, governance of institution, particularly uh, in assisting uh, companies or institution uh, to comply with Sharia. Um, okay, like to bagi Datuk Reza, but uh, we leave our sponsor to the final word uh, of this conference. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Brahim and uh, the rest of the panel uh, for giving me the opportunity today. Uh, I think, you know, I we are in a state where there is a lot of um, uh, what we say confusion in the industry because uh, the scope uh, the the skill uh, and all all that is 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 not pro properly defined uh, in this industry and as i i, I started off uh, uh, right from the start uh, sharia uh, was sharia audit is an afterthought it came after Islamic finance and, and it came after uh, everything else. So we really need to build on it and, and, and ensure that uh, it is there. And they all, you know, it, it, if you ask the industry to do it, um, I also have been in the Islamic banking institutions. Sometimes it's difficult to push this type of agenda. At, at even our industry level. So this is where I keep saying that, you know, the association like the MIA and the regulators uh, uh, should come in uh, to, to define this uh, in order for, for there to be proper scoping, proper skilling of the industry. Um, the beauty, uh, as what uh, Dr. Nick said, is an all-encompassing uh, uh, thing, Sharia. Uh, it's 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 okay to be different. Uh, it, it, so uh, we are going to make mistakes along the way as we uh, develop uh, the Sharia audit uh, framework and industry. But it's okay uh, as long as we get a start, and sooner or later uh, we will come to conformity on on this uh, issue. So I really like to see the industry move forward on on this uh, with some leadership being taken up at the uh, regulatory and the association level. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reza. Uh, Chen Azli? Now, we wouldn't want to, I mean, the big picture and all those things, we all of us have seen the, or rather discuss on this is quite broad. One thing, if I may, Islamic finance in Malaysia is less than 40 years old. And as what Datuk Reza said, the Sharia audit is even younger than that. So while there is, we, everybody agrees there's a need for the bigger or holistic view on things, my personal view now, each individual institution has to take first to play a part in terms of ensuring Sharia audit within the respective institution is in place and promin as prominent as internal audit. Yeah. Uh, use each in the, uh, institution set a statement of intent or whatever mission statement and all those things and get Sharia audit to come in at the end and say look have a look whether we are going something against what we intended to do because my intention as an organization we have gone through the process we have gone through the board and all so what i need now is the Sharia side similar to internal audit side Sharia audit also to validate what we have done or what our practice now is it in congruent with what we have set up to do so you have to start from there and once every institution is internalized this and it will grow to much to become a more a bigger picture and surely it will go into the mainstream yeah thank you thank you Chen um we have to draw this conversation to a close i just want to mention that the number of participants did not drop towards the end of the conversation 
this is a, an indicator either they just switch off the computer and left the, the, the monitor or they really stuck here until the end because they really feel that this is a topic that they need to address. I would like to believe that it is the latter, not the former. But if we can recap what has happened over the past uh, two hours since we started the conference at 9 o'clock, starting with Dr. Brindijit's uh, speech to Pastor Wahid to this conversation, is that there is a clear need for a uh, Sharia audit to be done. Um, so the scope of con con uh, conventional audit is inadequate. Um, but the objective of Makassi Sharia has to be achieved and the integrity of Sharia assurance has to be managed because compliancy and ritualistic behavior might not be able to achieve that objective. Definition setting is also important. All parties need to come together and be clear on what the definitions are for the organizations, for the activity that they want to do. In this case, the activity of auditing through the Sharia um, uh, methodology. And of course, trying to find a consistent methodology across companies in screening is very important. We need to adopt best practices uh, of the industry and the person or the company, or, sorry, or the organization that should, that should do it is the regulator, is the association, and is uh, and shouldn't be the organizations within it. Um, Dr. Dr. Rizal was mentioning, the CTO, the CRO, we name it, might be having some tunnel vision they might not be able to view it and plus i mean as a as a as a first party you wouldn't want more restrictions to be imposed on you so the only people that can do this is of course the external people uh people like mia ifim and the likes even by Nagara, uh, of course sc um uh, can also uh, join in this conversation and perhaps in order for this industry to move forward we need to have leadership to make it work but if there are no followers ready to follow the leader, uh, no matter how inspiring that leader is, uh, it's not going to happen. So perhaps all the players, all the participants this morning uh, might be inspired to take up that leadership and push forward for a better Sharia audit uh, uh, refinement, if I would call the word. Uh, and perhaps uh, all of us might be able to follow that kind of leadership. Um, there is a constant... Uh, problem that the industry is facing. There is little understanding in the implementation of the job. And because of that, there is limited availability of talent uh, and scarce resource uh, pool does pose a threat in this industry to be vibrant. Uh, and perhaps we need to align all these objectives together. I tried my best to make this conversation uh, an operational one, something that we can take some bullet points and then share uh, with our friends at the Kedagopi, uh, it turns out that some topics can't be done. That's my realization. Because uh, when it comes to shaping an industry, um, sometimes more, than, more often than not, uh, it's going to be a very cerebral conversation. Uh, the results mentioned a few times already uh, that, um, again, uh, sorry, normally I have a short uh, conclusion, but it's long. Uh, Dr. Reza was mentioning uh, that uh, uh, we can't uh, let this be an afterthought. We have to put this forefront. Uh, and perhaps when you build the house, the next big thing is to put furniture inside it and perhaps to interior decorate it. So the house of Islamic finance has been there, uh, as Sheikh Nazir was mentioning, 40 years already. Uh, perhaps now is the time for us to take that last approach, which is to refine and improve Sharia audit to make it better, not just for the Islamic finance industry, but for the industry at large, including that of the conventional. That's it. Okay, Kalas. Okay, let's uh, let's take a pause. Thank you very much, Datuk Nik, Datuk Reza, Cik Nazli. Nice to meet you guys again. Uh, and of course, uh, in spirit, as usual, our external auditor is with us, uh, but has left early. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have another forum coming. Uh, so uh, for now, uh, let's just uh, pause this session. Again, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Thank you.